This program is not for children. If you're under the age of 13, get the hell out of here. From the deepest, darkest recesses of Dangerous Nerds headquarters, Keith Moncrief and Gary Kissel. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Pop Culture Minefield. That's Keith over there. And that's Gary. And down below there in the Brady Bunch box, that's <laughs> director Rod Lorix. Uh, I'm actually a fan of your first film. It's uh, good. Yeah, because uh, Deterrent is, I thought it was a, a convincing thriller. I was intrigued by why you, you shot like the, the black and white. Uh, well, because I, I, th that's a very good question. No, literally nobody's ever asked me that and nobody watching this really cares because they don't know what the movie is. But the, we, go from the movie? Black, we go from black and white to color in the film because I wanted to show, uh, very specifically show that nothing is black and white, right? And so, um, if, if you, the way that we switch and transition from black to white in that film is we push in on a, on a TV set in the old days when you saw all the pixels. Yeah. And, and it looks black and white, like gray, black, white, right? But as you push in, you see that actually there are colors there. And that what you think is black and white is actually full of color and full of nuance. And so that was just my uh, sort of, film geek trying to show off that's well, who yeah, i am you have gone from being a journalist to, to making your first film really like that and i thought it was uh, an adventurous uh endeavor doing what you did uh gutsy ballsy but you're army yeah. so i expect that um, <laughs> yeah so. not, yeah i used to be i used to be yeah a long time uh, ago yeah and um I wanted to kind of go back a little bit because Keith and I, um, you know, like you, we're all kids of the '60s. Uh, you've got us by two, you've got me by two years, and you've got Keith by six years. Okay. And uh, so we're in the same age group. And um, I was just curious. We were cinephiles as kids. Were you? Yeah. What were the kind of films? Yes, you watched? I was a big time cinephile. It's all it's really all I cared about when I was uh, when I was a little kid. But you want to know something? That's kind of, is that when I was a kid, I I loved movies. Oh my god! Right. Uh, I wanted to go to movies every weekend, every night if I could. But I didn't know that movies were made. They were just there, right? Yeah. So I didn't know what a director was, and I didn't know what a cinematographer was. I didn't even know what an actor was. I did think it was kind of weird that the same guy who was Moses was also in Planet of the Apes. That was weird. Couldn't quite figure, figure it out. But, <laughs> so when I was growing up, my, my heroes were not directors. They were not, my heroes were film critics because, oh my God, that's the best job on the planet Earth and you must be a special human being to be a film critic. So I began a relationship by pen when I was like 10 or 11 years old with like Roger Ebert, Pauline Kael, people, people like wow. that, you know, well, that was, I, that was, I, by the way, I knew Roger Ebert and, uh, cause I was a critic oh, yeah. for a central Illinois magazine and he would come to Champaign all the time. Cause I was at the U of I and we'd have lunch oh, okay. together every once in a while. And, and, uh, he, he got annoyed with me because I'm, I'm a funny guy. So I'm always cracking jokes. Uh, and I, and I'd poke fun at some of his reviews. But it was when we went to see 2001 A Space Odyssey during the um, Cyberfest uh -huh. in 97. He was walking up in front of me going into the Virginia Theater there in Champaign-Urbana. And he had a foot-long sandwich and he stumbled and was about to fall. And instead of protecting himself, he huddled that <laughs> damn sandwich <laughs> like a football. Oh, that's fantastic. And he could hear me giggling behind him. <laughs> and he shot me the dirtiest look. Well, let, me, let, me, let me tell you something about Roger. And this is what I told my son. I said, a real man isn't Chuck Norris, or it's not a football player, it's Roger Ebert. Because Roger went through some terrible, terrible medical shit in his life to the yes, point he where, where he, can't, he literally can't eat. He's gotta be fed intravenously. And it looked like he was wearing a Roger Ebert mask. It was a totally paralyzed face. And he couldn't speak. 
he could only write. And that's when he began his most voracious writing spree and wrote some of the most amazing essays and so on. And that's a guy who and would I have suspected that was because he sensed that uh, he had limited time. Yeah, but a lot of guys at that point, they, they surrender. They watch movies. They, you know, they spend time with their well, Yeah, exactly. Whatever. That is what shows that courage that you're talking about. I agree mm -hmm. with you. I liked was. Roger Ebert a lot. And yeah. um, I, it was a sad damn day when we lost him. Uh, mm -hmm. we, even after I moved I, and quit that magazine, I still talked to him every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, once he was gone, that was it. But um, yeah. uh, going back to uh, that period throughout the history of cinema, uh, there's always been this conflict that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. that with um, fact versus fiction, where right. the creative license takes place in filmmaking. And, mm -hmm. and of course, I'm going to cite one of the, the, the better known moments where it backfired, but the film did great. One Oscar, uh, okay. you know, but uh, I'm talking about The Bridge on the River Kwai, uh, okay. based on the book by uh, uh, Buell. But David Lean directed it. It's a fantastic film. Beautifully yeah. written, but it is absolutely nowhere near the facts. And when they invited, right, well, but I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's a ten, that movie. I think was. Uh, I think Pierre Boulle's book is considered a novel, and a the book itself was a fictionalization of uh, of events. Um, it was. It was not meant to be accurate. Now, you know, uh, there are there are other movies that you can that that you can look at. That I think be, may even better fit that model. A movie, say like uh, Patton. Yeah, or uh, you know what? Better yet, Lawrence of Arabia, which is what wow. many people think, right? Keith, I mean, many people think that's the best film ever made. So, like, like my Steven Spielberg said, best movie ever made, and yet, and, and in fact, I have um, I have a deal to uh, to do a mini series about Lawrence Arabia. So I wow. have I, I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but I, we have the deal, and yeah. I um, so I did a lot of research and. While Lawrence of Arabia may be the best movie ever made and amazing for film students, it's not so good for history students. It's like just full of shit in terms of historical accuracy. And, um, you know, I guess this is what you're doing is you're, you're expertly leading into the accuracies or inaccuracies of my movie, The Outpost. That's <laughs> yes, yeah, it's what really you're slowly what I'm walking you're through. Going to it I, of, of I admire your film. <laughs> uh, I absolutely was engrossed by your film. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And um, that, you know, and to get into it, but you know, I, I do want to get into it. But I know Keith had a question here uh, okay. about ahead, directors. Keith. So cool. well, uh, no, no. I mean, I mean, I like I like getting into the film because mine was more of just like question from the past and more about a film or a cinephile that becomes a director. But I mean, I'd, I'd like to talk about your film. So uh, uh, first of all, seriously, what made you pick this particular story? Well, uh, the story picked me. You know, and I and I and I literally did. I mean, yeah, it was brought to me. To, I'll give you guys a little inside scoop: is I wasn't at all the first director on this film, and I don't know how many directors they had on this film, but the first director on this film was Sam Raimi. Wow, uh, you know, Spider-Man, Evil Dead. He's a great mm -hmm. director, um, but for some reason he decided he couldn't do it or didn't want to do it. And um, he brought me to his office, and in his office was um, a guy that worked with him, Paul Merriman, and the two writers of the original draft of the screenplay, Paul Tamasi and, and, and Final Draft, uh, Eric Eric Johnson. And he said, you know, why don't I produce and you direct or d discuss the possibility of, of my doing that? And guys, I mean, this is a very, very famous battle within the military community. It's probably the most heroic battle of the, uh, the Afghanistan war. And, um, you know, I, I was very interested. I wasn't available at the time. Um, and when I did become available, um, uh, Sam was gone. But mm -hmm. his, his, his head of development, Paul, was there and the writers were there. And you know what? They met with me um, at a, a restaurant in Studio City, California, called Arts Deli. And Arts Deli is like a really classic joint for 
people on the fringes to meet. You know, it's very rare that you have like high level meetings at Arts Deli. But mm -hmm. when you have these independent films, they want to get together. A lot of the old timers come there. They, I, you know, they want to make, uh, you know, a movie even they haven't made one in 20 years. And they talk about it over, over pastrami sandwiches, one of those places. And, uh, and so, so we, we meet there and they say, let's make a mini series about life at this outpost. And the final like, episode will be a big battle, right? And I thought the miniseries isn't going to work. It's going to be repetitive. It's going to be dour. You know, th this could be a very inspirational film. And, and I think we should stick with it as a film. And um, Paul Tamasey, the writer, says at some point, um, you know, there's this company called Millennium that always wanted to make this film. And I said, well, let's get over there. And so they get on the phone. They call up Millennium. They set up a meeting for the next day. And, uh, you know, it's a bunch of Israeli dudes, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I'm Israeli. I was born in Israel. Yeah, you, and so I, I, I can read about say, that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm an Israeli guy. And uh, and that day we had we made a deal with him. And uh, next thing you know, we're trying to cast the film and trying to find locations. And uh, and, and, and we did it. So. So they, I, I guess they came to me because I think I may be the only guy in the Directors Guild, feature film maker in the Directors Guild that's uh, a graduate of the military academy at West Point. Yeah, and that's oh. fantastic. And, and and by the way, I wanted to point out, I always thought I had like the weirdest transitioning career from being a, a U.S. Army combat medic. It was obvious when I became a civilian, I was going to go into medical. And I went medical. I was a yeah. paramedic and, and uh, did nursing care. And then um, in 1995, I left it all behind and became a comic book artist and, and uh, journalist. Oh, is that right? Yeah, oh, my wow. first okay. job was as a movie critic and um, for the right. Oculus Magazine. That's how I met Roger Ebert. And, right. uh, but the, uh, you know, the editor was like, uh, you can cartoon and you were really good at writing reviews. You're hired. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something. That's really interesting you say that because... I didn't do comic books, but I'm a caricaturist, and I love um, that. yeah, I, I now I, I um, my, my dad is probably the uh, according to the Guinness Book of World Records the most successful political cartoonist who ever lived, and still lives, and um, and I used to when and, and then I became a film critic and I would do caricatures of the you know the stars of movies. Yeah. And, okay. And, and that when I was 18 years old and I lived in Hawaii, um, I, I worked at the Hilton Hawaiian Village and I would be the uh, sidewalk cartoonist. I would draw the tourists. No kidding. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh. And There's like this job. weird connection between you and yeah, I. So next time I like you're going to be, be a filmmaker chasing me out of the business. And speaking <laughs> of Israeli, by the way, um, I ca I'm the only Irish Roman Catholic out of a family of six Jews. All my oh, siblings. Okay, that's good. All of them are Jewish. I had a different dad, and my mom converted to Catholicism. Is that right? Wow. Okay. Well, you know what? The, the guilt remains the same. Oh, yeah, it is. It's like that's why we're all the same. And the funny part was in the 80s, I went to um, almost, two, almost two semesters before I walked out of seminary. And my, my brother Michael wanted to be uh, a rabbi. Okay. And my, my mom at the same time, and my mom was just ecstatic. That she might have a rabbi and a priest's son. But then I, I was like, no, I like girls. It's oh, just okay. Well, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, Miguel, the the um, the Catholics uh, feel guilty and the Jewish mothers make you feel guilty. So yeah. It, uh, and my first experience with a Jewish mother was hilarious. Because yeah. I'm like sitting there going, they really do ask about you pooping. Okay. <laughs> what is that? I'm this like, is a very. I gotta say, this is a very weird podcast. You, you guys, <laughs> two of you are you're 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 an odd bunch. Yes, we're, we're. I well, I've done stand up comedy too, and so okay. I just I didn't want to do this show. I wanted him to do it. That kind of <laughs> and he he wanted me, and I'm like, all right, fine, I'll I'll be on the show. Right. And right. uh, but we started doing interviews, thinking it would be fun for the the guys to just relax and not feel like they're on a regular talk show <laughs> okay yeah you're succeeding so far <laughs> <laughs> Woo
Well, but, uh, yeah, go on, Keith. I know you got a question. Well, you know, having graduated from West Point, that is incredible, an incredible dichotomy to go from that to finding yourself on a movie set. I mean, right. uh, for you, I mean, the first time you were on set, what was that first day like, if you can remember? Well, I, I do remember. I, it, well, I, I was making a short film, actually. And, you know, I, I really just felt very, very comfortable. Good. I can't say that I was um, that I was uncomfortable, or that I was scared. Mostly because the stakes were not as high because it's it, it was it was a short film. I had written I had written the the, the screenplay, mm -hmm. and and I had before this you know I went from the military to being a journalist, and part of my journalism, not just film criticism, was interviewing, and I had um, I had made it a point to interview director after director after director, the best in the business. You know, from Cindy Lumet, my hero, to Steven Spielberg, my other hero, and and you know and George Miller, everybody, and and I would always ask them. I turn off the tape recorder, and I would always say to them, um, "I really want to do what you're doing at some point. Can you give me some piece of advice that is not try really hard, keep keep going, do movies with you that you love. I mean, don't give me a cliche. Give me something really practical." And so each one of them would give me like some piece of advice, like James Cameron said to me, um, sound. He said, sound can be whatever you want it to be. If, you know, if you have got um, uh, the sound of a, of a truck uh, descending off a, off a hill, do what Steven Spielberg did and have it go. And it's the sound of a whale coming down. So I really wrote down all that advice. I took all that advice and I just felt, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know, uh, you know, when I got to that set and, um, I, you know, I just started to learn. It was when I made the first feature film, which was Deterrence, where I started, uh, you know, making some real mistakes and um, where I felt myself somewhat at times. And um, the one experience is a really important thing for a for a director to have and i understand that uh, you must lead personalities differently and that's something that you know that really i was taught at the academy and taught and taught in the military keith and that is that uh i caught it when you said it that what you learned in the military really did help you as a director when when you're in the military you learn that um uh, when you lead, you lead different personalities differently, and you have to adjust, to, you know, your leadership style to the individuals involved. And I really didn't quite understand that. Uh, I mean, I should have understood it when I made my first film, Deterrence. Um, but it wasn't until I started getting into the contender that, you know, that I did understand that to a certain degree, uh, being on set is like being on, um, you know, in, in, a, in a military setting. There is a hierarchy, and when you do have to delegate, and um, when you do have to understand that that you will lead people differently um, based on who they are. Yeah, hmm. I hear you, because uh, I found in my personal life uh, things I learned in the military really helped me take. I was always picked to be in a leadership role uh, mm -hmm. since the military. That never happened before the army. Right. And so that is a gift that the army gave me was this ability to be self-confident, self-assured. And even if I'm not sure of the situation, I look like I know what I'm doing. Well, look, on, on the set of the outpost, we have a lot of military personnel, right? A lot of military personnel. And so what happens is that when you run into a hiccup or you run into a problem, which happens all the time on movie sets, especially ones as remote and as difficult and um, as time consumptive, as th this movie is, because you've got a bunch of people who have been in a tougher scrape than this, um, there was a sense of calm on the set, and that was uh, that was extremely important to uh, to our success. And yeah. just even getting the movie made, this is a very difficult movie to get made. You yeah, know? a buddy of mine once said, and I think you'll appreciate this. He says, "Once you face down the evil end of AK-47, uh, full intent on killing you, and you walk away from it, everything else is just ice cream." Well, you know, that's that's very true, I'm certain. I can't quite relate to that because I've never experienced that. 
when I, gra when I graduated West Point, I, I graduated into, into the peacetime army. And so I never actually served in combat, but my classmates did. And um, th that has always been, and I don't want to say it's guilt because it's not my fault. We were not at war. Um, but um, I, it's not the greatest feeling. You know, you go back to your reunion. And yeah, it's a, it's a form of survivor, survivor's guilt. I, 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 I guess so. I, I don't even want to be as dramatic as that. They are just much more, they're accomplished in the area of combat and battle, and I'm not. And I guess one of the reasons why I really wanted to make a war film, particularly in Afghanistan or Iraq war film, because that's the war, war my brothers fought in, was the... Uh, I, I don't want to use words like to honor them and so on, although that's definitely what we did because that makes it sound like this movie is spinach and it's not. Yeah, it's right. not a, I think it's a very, uh, a word entertaining is a bad word to use, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it is what it is. I mean, uh, at the beginning it, of it's my very inspiring war story is what it is. At the beginning of my graphic novel, I wrote this, this book is uh, a love letter to every, fellow veteran of mine who left a piece of themselves on the battlefield. Okay. That, I think maybe I should start using that. <laughs> May I steal that? I'm just going to let Steal it. Just say, that's from this uh, dumb comic guy I know. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that. I, that's taking up too much time. I'm just going <laughs> to steal it from the same way. Steal away. I like word love letter. It is, this is a love letter to the American I consider children. your film a love letter. Yeah, um, to the American soldier. Absolutely. And I was inspired by the fact that you did something because I worked for Dale Dye. You know who he is. Yeah, uh, and now I don't know who Dale Dye is. Dale Dale uh, worked for me on a movie I made. Yeah, I am. I'm his artist. I I do. Is that uh, right? Yeah, I did the artwork for his and Tom Hanks' planned film, uh, No Better Place to Die. I storyboarded it, did production art, um, and he hired me because um, I'm a military historian as well as a veteran, okay. and he knew that I knew my shit. So I do all of his book covers because he has a publishing division, Warriors Publishing, and I do all their book covers. And okay. Julia is one of my closest friends, his wife. Um, they're family to me. Um, they've actually like, well, they've been to my house. So, <laughs> Well, that's nice. I mean, D Dale did a voiceover for me in my movie called Resurrecting the Champ. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I mean, Dale, I love Dale, that movie, by the way. Thank you. Well, Dale's a tough dude. I mean, he's... He's he's okay, and um, we had some great military experts on on our film though. The new Dale guys, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, people like the names Jericho Demon and Ray Mendoza, and you know I, you know, here, here's a, here's another truth for you, which is that everybody's so excited you got this director who was in the military and he graduated from the best military academy in the, in the world, and um, we're all set, and he's going to know what he's doing. But you know, I was in the air defense in Germany. I wasn't in the, in the mountains of Afghanistan, and uh, there's a lot of shit that I don't know. And so I really needed uh, the you know mil military expertise on that on that set. And I and I sure I sure got it. In fact, we had people who actually fought in the Battle of Kamdesh, which is what this movie is about. Yeah, and I was that was so awesome that you did that. Um, yeah. it took actual vets that served in that battle. And have them play themselves in the film. Yeah, well, in one case, a guy actually plays himself himself, and, and he relives the battle, and he has to relive the death of his best friend, and he recreated that for us, uh, Jerry. I mean, that's, can you imagine that? Mm. And um, his name is Daniel Rodriguez, and this this kid is a this kid is something special. He fought in the mortar battle. A few days before the battle, he's talking with his best friend. Kevin Thompson, and he says, I promise you when I get out of here, when I fucking get out of here, I'm going to become a college football star and I'm going to become an NFL star and an NFL player. And Daniel is like 130 pounds. I mean, he's a tiny guy. Okay. It makes no sense. So he, after the battle, he, he applied to and got into Clemson University, joins the football team, and then played four preseason games with the Seattle Seahawks. Get out wow. of here. That's that crazy. was pretty cool. But this cat comes on the set, and he, and he recreates the death of his friend Kevin. And he was um, 
cool and calculated about it and even a little cold. Um, and then it was after we were done filming that he went and fell apart, which is what a good soldier does. Wow. Yeah, yeah I was, wow. um, I, you know, my girlfriend, uh, she just, she gets quiet and leaves me alone because if I watch a war film, I don't cry watching regular films. I only cry watching war films. Yeah. The more realistic it is, the more emotional I get. Yeah. And, uh, and man, it, it, I was, it, it, yeah. I was a wreck watching your film. Yeah, I, I'm getting that from I'm getting that from a lot of uh, veterans, especially, and um, and that they are train wrecks by the end of the film. But I'm getting it from normal people too. But the but what, what's happening here is is, is this uh, tragedy doesn't come from death. I don't think. I think tragedy comes from what death costs us, and and, and the future is that it takes away. Yeah, you know, we die when the romance will never blossom because of a death or the great yeah. can't, can't be realized. And um, I think we come to know these men so well that those who do die, we're really we're really moved by it and understand what will not be because they have uh, because they have died. I got to know the families of these men really well. I bet. Yeah, well, really. What was that like? Well, I mean, they're my family now, and I love them, and I think. I think many of them love me and um, um, not to buzz kill you, but when I was making this movie, um, uh, my son Hunter died and I oh. you know, found out he was in, in the hospital. When I, was, I did not know about that. that yeah, when I was in, yeah. When I was in, yeah, I see buzz kill. <laughs> when I was in, when I was in prep, I um, uh, got the word that he, he had had a call cardiac arrest and he was in the hospital in Michigan and I got to Michigan just in time um, to tell him I loved him and to watch him expire in, uh, in front of my eyes. Wow. And, um, yeah. And he was the same age as these men. Wow. And the families, now the families are really behind me and I'm in this terrible club with them and they know I'm not going to take the deaths of their kids for granted. I almost didn't make the movie. I mean, I almost didn't go back. Uh, yeah. I mean, do you, you have kids, Keith? Yeah, yeah I, I, two boys yeah. uh, and, and a daughter, but my boys were both in the Army. And uh, so they were, I can't even begin to fathom. Did they, did they serve overseas? Did they serve in Iraq or Afghanistan? Or? Actually, uh, both of them, uh, one of them went and came back, and the other one stayed here the entire time. So... So um, you could have, you could have lost the, the one that went over there, and it's it just it just to me it was this whole thing wasn't fathomable until it became fathomable. Yeah, and, and now, um, so you know, um, uh, you've watched the movie, you know that uh, that the the deaths are very realistic, and 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 in fact, uh, when you do a realistic death, it's not as bad as these exaggerated deaths in the movie. They just drop. Yeah. But uh, important, you see, you see, Jerry. What's important here is that you 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 establish that like the character, uh, his character named Scusa, who wanted to become an officer. That was his life's goal. Yeah, he was this nerdy guy who wanted to be an officer, and he had a little kid. And he dies when he dies. He dies like that. And so do all those dreams. Everything just goes away. Just like that, and it's like, what the fuck just happened here? And that's really uh, what I sort of one of the things that I want people to understand that we don't die with a musical score, and you know, we don't die from several angles, and we don't die in slow motion. We just die. And um, I know that if Hunter's death were to be portrayed on a film, I would want it to be done with um, uh, with honesty. And so that's one of the things that. I think we bring this film. I, I mean, I don't want people to get the. I, I think most people who are listening to this probably have already seen the movie. That's that's when I like listening to these podcasts. Mm -hmm. But if those of you who have not seen it, it's not a morose film. I mean, it's 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 a film that I think is. is no, it doesn't even get really into the the nuts and bolts of anything until halfway through. Right, but, uh, it, but even when we get character building, you did great character building. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I felt I felt that we did, and it's um, and that and that's what we're talking about is that none of this is meaningful. The battle is not meaningful if the men fighting it are not somehow meaningful to us. And um, so we were 
you know, we're really cognizant of that. Yeah. Very much so. And that's, you know, and I appreciate it probably more than anybody. Um, and, you know, I, I just love the the realism. And, and when you were talking about it, because like I described at one time what it looks like when somebody dies, because uh, I've seen a lot of people get killed and uh, had to deal with a lot of death. And um, it's like, remember when we were kids, the Mickey Mouse uh, push button puppet? Yeah. And they'd string it and you push that button and they just drop. Yeah. I, I describe to people, that's what it's like. Uh, it's really freaky. You're just like, oh, that person just fell over. Yeah. <laughs> just drop right where they were standing. And it's it's uh, it's very shocking. It is, it is, and but in, in in the case of this movie, every man that died, and almost every single man that's portrayed in the film, died or got wounded, um, trying to save the life of somebody else. Yeah, and that's uh, and that's and, that, and that's a really because I saw the documentary uh, a while back, and I kept wondering when is somebody going to make this movie. Yeah. Well, this is not a a, a documentary of Restrepo, but Restrepo is it's it's a similar situation, and. Um, Oh no! There was an actual uh, YouTube documentary. I oh right! Watching. No, no, you're you're correct. Right? It's made by CNN. Yes. Yeah, and I watched it and was just. And, and by the way, let's. Can I just take this opportunity to remind everybody that this movie is based on a book by Jake Tapper. Yep. And you know, um, I don't know. You've got the you you know you you got a real uh, vibe to you, Jerry. That's politically different than uh, Keith's vibe to me. I don't know why, but. <laughs> Uh, what I can we are, he's a liberal and I'm conservative, but we're both centrists. Okay. So yeah. we never here's, argue. here's the thing. Here's the thing. This movie is completely but so I was right. It was completely it's a movie is completely a apolitical. Yeah. And it's a like a good war film should be. Yeah, it, it should be. And every good war film should be an anti war film. Anti not the cause of the war, the reason the war is there. Because right now, Keith, when your son was was over there. And he had to answer, why am I here? He probably didn't have an answer. Probably what he was able to say, I know what I'm doing here. What I'm doing here is keeping my brother alive. And I'm yeah. surviving, right? But, you yeah. know, I don't know, you know, we know, we knew why we were fighting World War II. Everybody would tell you was to stop Hitler. We don't know, nobody knows why they're fighting the Afghanistan war anymore. Yeah. There's no reason for, I don't think, you know, so, the, but the movie, the movie is, is uh, like, Completely, um, completely a. Yeah, there's not one discussion, not one time, and I like that because that's how it was. Like in my unit, we it's like if we were doing stuff that we were told to do, we just did it. We were doing our jobs. Yeah, uh, do no, your job or somebody dies. Yeah, yeah. I will think that's changed a little bit recently, um, in um, because I think that there's a lot of diminishment uh, of our military and our military leaders um, right now that I think is very offensive to the people that are serving in the military. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it was, it has always been that we love the American soldier that you could, that, you know, politically, um, you know, it's interesting. It used to be that we hated one another's leaders. Now we just hate one another. But the one thing that most of us agree on is that the soldier is a very valued person that office the military officers are you know good people and, and and decent leaders and that has been diminished in the past couple of years and i think that there is great offense uh you know that that has that has been taken but you know there was never a point in this movie you know i've you know i'm a very political guy and i'm not going to tell you what side i'm on yeah it's nobody's business it's well I am, I'm all over it on Twitter and Facebook and so on. So it's everyone's business. But oh, I guess I better follow you more closely. It's not relevant to it's not relevant to this conversation. But you know, nobody ever fired a, fires a weapon in the Apples and he yells "fuck Bush" or "fuck Obama." You know, they never. Nobody says either one of those things. It's just you're my brother, and I'm going to keep you uh, alive, and we're here, and we're in this mess and, and and our military leaders put us in this mess but that's not a political thing that's a military strategy thing it's it's also a chain of command thing is that yeah. and in many ways uh since you're, you're a cineast the this movie um reflects the philosophy not the quality of i would never say that but the philosophy of a movie like paths of glory which says that too often our military leaders don't consider 
what they're doing um, uh, to these numbers that they look at, and these numbers being the, uh, the American soldier. Well, two, they're, they're too dis, disassociated to what's going on on the ground. They're focused on the, the stats and numbers that are being brought in and forgetting that those are people. Yeah. Uh, and that's something that I ran into. Um, I was mm-hmm. now I was a big fan of my uh, immediate officers, my XO, and they were just the coolest people. They got it. But the minute you started getting up the higher chain of command, yeah, they, start, they start to they start to lose um, a little focus of it. You know, this outpost was placed there uh, for counterinsurgency to allow what a horrible to place move. to put it in a bowl. Well, the bottom well, of this, a bowl. That's the point, the point I'm getting to is. They put them at the bottom of a bowl, but they thought that their reasoning was worth the risk. And um, in my opinion, and eventually in the opinion of the army and their investigations, it was not at all worth the risk. It was a terrible, terrible decision. Terrible decision. All, you know, all in. Thanks, Army Intelligence. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you say that again, please? I said, thanks, Army Intelligence. <laughs> I'm afraid I have to confess something to you. What? I didn't get that that time. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said thanks, Army Intelligence. Oh, I see. That's right. That's a, yeah. That's absolutely correct. I've got I've got friends on Army Intel and Counter Intel, and I make fun of them all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, they they say that that is one of the greatest misnomers: military intelligence. Yeah, but I know some very smart people in military intelligence. A lot of my classmates are smart cookies who are. You did a great job. A great job well, in there. fact, the producer, one of the producers on this show, Jim Woodward, uh, my childhood best friend, is retired uh, Army Intel. Oh, really? What, yeah. what rank did he get in the military? Uh, he went to uh, the top of the Warrant Officer Corps. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah, Warrant Officers, cool, cool people. Yeah, that's how he retired. We call him Mister, Mister this, Mister that. I think. It's yeah, great. and what's great about it is after he retired, he went right back to work as a civilian, doing the same job with the same people. That's oh, know. is that right? Yeah, <laughs> okay. a lot of people do that in MR. Yeah, a few people, say. absolutely. And he does it, he's still doing it. <laughs> I love the guy. He's well, we're he's my best friend. He's yeah. I've known him. He's doing that and he's, in, uh, What's that? Well, he's doing that and he, and he, he's doing that and he's doing your show. He's producing this uh, excellent yeah. quality show. Yeah, <laughs> uh, how did you two guys? Well, how did you, how did you two guys meet? The two Comic convention. I, a co- a comic convention. Book book. Yeah. Keith, I, Keith. So what, Keith? Are you? Oh, I, I, I worked this with the organizers. I helped to organize a convention, and I met Gary one day, and we just sort of hit it off. You know, G- Gary is a personality and a force that, when you come into his orbit, you can't help but, but have a, in my case, a positive reaction. You know, I, he's he's a breath of fresh I, air. I needed a new black friend. <laughs> oh my god! Okay. Well, I, 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 I did too. I, I did too. So I married her. Oh, good job. <laughs> so did my brother. He met the best woman of his life. Um, but uh, you know, going going back, I really want to ask you a couple of questions because I know we're getting close to the end of this. Um, yeah. uh, Kieran Bug, who's a friend of ours, uh, he wanted to ask, and you kind of went over this before, but he wants to ask, what inspired you to make this film? Well, it's it's what I said. It's I, I really wanted to um, uh, do a love letter to my brothers, to, to quote you. No, you already stole it. Down. Good man. <laughs> More important than I've already stolen it. No, that's how it's going to work from now on. Um, Tim Vo, who does a very popular uh, uh, vlogcast on YouTube, uh, Lord's Longbox, he's a friend of ours, and he wanted to know how involved was Jake Tappert in the making of the film? Um, how was Jake Tapper involved in the film? How how much? Yeah, Jake Tapper. Jake Tapper. I'm sorry. Yeah, he wanted to know how much he was involved. I love- Oh, Jay Tapper, uh, you know, very involved. I mean, he was, he got every draft of the screenplay and, um, and, and I often turned to him for uh, advice and from his, for his historical information. It was, it was really interesting because when I called him for the first time, 
all I wanted to do was talk politics. All he wanted to do was talk movies. And so we <laughs> sort of have to uh, in, 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 every, in every conversation now. Because uh, I'm really, I, I'm really in presidential politics. That's funny. I'm going to have to follow you more closely because I hadn't caught that yet. Because mostly I've been catching your posts about the movie. Um, let's see. Maybe, uh, maybe you don't want to follow me, so Terry. Let's put it that way. Maybe. No, I have maybe you better. <laughs> I have a lot of friends who are liberal. I'm fine with it. I get along with them. I never, Keith and I never fight. We never fight, ever. Um, we, we, I, I, with Gary, it's just easy to talk about things. I mean, I just literally fight. take okay, a lot of the right edge out of a like lot of things. I don't like fighting. I like uh, getting along. I like uh, discussing ideas and maybe finding a middle ground. Um, okay. Gordon Freeman asks, have you ever had an experience with a drill sergeant similar to Full Metal Jacket? Um, yes, of course. But when I was a plebe at West Point, when you go in there and they just haze the shit out of you, and they're actually trying to drive you out. Um, the guy that hazed me the most, and that was the toughest guy there, um, was a guy named Mick Nicholson. He was a fantastic cadet. He was like a classic, brilliant cadet. He became the first captain of West Point. And uh, now he's a four-star general, but he was also the colonel who established this outpost. It really does wow. go full circle. Wow. That is. That's, that is a huge wow. Um, and my buddy, the Marine, uh, Joe Zeitz, yeah. uh, he wants to know... Uh, Ask him to be honest and tell me how he broke into the biz. Well, um, of course I'm going to be honest. I, I broke into the business. I was a film critic for a long time. And I, I held these film classes. I would show movies of, you know, people that were putting out movies for the first time and bringing the directors and the producers and I, you know, like every other film critic, I wrote a, I wrote a screenplay and I showed it to this director. His name is Mark Rocco. He's since passed away. And his uh, producing partner, Mark Friedman, who read it, they loved it. Or, and, um, and they just, we, we tried to get it made as a film and it didn't work. I couldn't get that film made. But this producer thought he was a great guy. He said, I'm going to give you a couple thousand or a few thousand dollars a month to just go in that office and write. And eventually you're going to come up with something. And he was right. And he's still my partner today. He's still That's fantastic. Uh, Cause I just wanted to point out something you said earlier. It's like, um, uh, coming after your job as a filmmaker. Uh, that's what I went to school for was to be a filmmaker. Where? Uh, I went to the U of I. Okay. Uh, and I dropped out. I got bored. And uh, I'm like, this is just not for me. I'll just be a filmmaker one day. And so I've actually gone back to it. I've worked for a lot of filmmakers. And I've just said, you know what, fuck it. I'm in my 50s. I'm going to go, go for it. And uh, we're, Keith's involved with it. Joe Zeitz, the Marine that asked that question, he's involved with me. And we're all making a, a, a horror film about veterans caught in a horror situation. Okay. Well, that seems like I, I would say that's a very smart idea. Yeah, it's like, because we don't react to horror the way other people do, and that's what's going to be funny about the film, is how soldiers <laughs> react to horror. <laughs> I can't, you know what? I'll be first in line to buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I want to thank you for coming on the show, Rod. It's It's been a real pleasure. It's an honor. Um, I, I am a fan of yours, uh, you. you know, it, long before this, and I just want you to know, if, if we could ever get you back on, I'd like to know if you'd enjoy coming back of course are you kidding me I mean, you know i mean it's, it's like being on lethal weapon show yeah <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Anyway, you take care of yourself thank Rod. you very much rod Cheers. and you get out of here and we'll uh close the show thanks for coming thank you very much my friend peace Cheers. out my brother bye 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 wow well that's another episode of pop culture minefield and that's Keith. Uh, that's Gary. And we just had Rod Laurie on the show. That was that's fantastic. Amazing. All right. I know, right? Yeah. Get up our lawns. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching Pop Culture Minefield. If you've enjoyed the show, please remember to like and subscribe.
And don't forget to hit the bell icon. Remember, you can find us at Pop Culture Minefield on both Facebook and Instagram. Thank you again.